T today's lecture is about behavioral finance, um, and uh, this is a term that emerged uh, into public con consciousness around the uh, mid 1990s. Before that, it was unknown. The term efficient markets is much older. I, I mentioned the idea goes back to the uh, 19th century. The term goes back to the 1960s. Uh, but behavioral finance is a newer uh, revolution in finance, uh, and it's something that I've been very involved with. Um, I've been organizing workshops in behavioral finance ever since 1991, working with uh, Professor Richard Thaler at University of Chicago. So we've been doing that for uh, 18 years. It's amazing. It's a long time for you, right? <laughs> uh, when we started, uh, we were uh, total outcasts, we thought. Uh, nobody appreciated us. Uh, I had tenure, so I could do it. But, uh, you know, the problem is you don't want to do things that are too out of fashion. Uh, fortunately, we have a system that allows it to happen. I'm very happy to have that. But uh, what behavioral finance is, is a reaction against extreme, some extreme uh, that we see in efficient markets theory, or in also in mathematical finance. Mathematical finance is a beautiful structure, and I admire what people have done, and I've worked in it myself, um, but uh, it has its limits. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, the way a, a paradigm develops, it goes through a certain phase. When mathematical was f finance was new, say in the 1960s, it was all the exciting thing. And nobody wanted to work on anything else. You wanted to be doing the exciting thing. Uh, as the 70s and 80s wore on, it got to be a little bit overdone. You know, people run with it too far, and they think, there's the, they think that's all we want to do, and we don't want to think about anything else. And then they start to get sometimes a little crazy. Uh, and, uh, and, and so then we had to reflect that, well, you know, things aren't perfect. <laughs> the world isn't, isn't perfect, and we have real people in the world. Uh, so, um, uh, that led to the behavioral finance. So, behavioral finance really means, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it's not like behavioral psychology. It doesn't mean behavioral psychology applied to finance. It really means something much more broad than that. It means all of the other social sciences applied to finance. So, um, the, um, uh, the Economics department is just one of many uh, departments in the university that uh, 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 teaches us something about how people behave. And so, if we want to understand how people behave, we, we can't rely only on economics department. So, I think that it, it's coming around to a, a unifying of our understanding. Uh, and uh, since then, our, uh, since the beginnings in the 90s, our behavioral finance workshops have grown and grown. And of course, so many people are involved in it now. It's now very well established. So, before I get into that, I wanted to give some additional reflections on the last lecture. Um, and I have this chart, which you saw last time. Uh, actually, it's an Excel spreadsheet that I, uh, I also put it up already on the uh, on the um, Classes V2 uh, website, and so you can play with it. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, reflect again. I, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, but it's, it's very important. And I'll, uh, uh, what we have in this chart is the, the blue line is the uh, Standard & Poor Composite Stock Price Index, uh, going back to 1871, from 1871 to uh, 2008, right now. So that's uh, uh, like 130 years of data, and that's the blue line. You can see the, um, that, you know what that is there? That's 1929, and that, that is the crash of 1929. Well, actually, it extended to 1932. Uh, and you can see other historic movements. There's the, the bull market of the 1990s, very big uh, upswing. And then there's the crash from 2000 to 2003. I don't know if you remember these things. They were big news. Not as big as the 1929 crash. But the upswing 
was just as big as the 1920s upswing, wasn't it? Here's the 1920s upswing, and here's the <coughs> 1990s upswing. Huge upswing in stock prices. Um, this is in logs, by the way, so that means that uh, everything, uh, it, uh, the same vertical distance uh, it refers to the same percentage change in the price. And then I had, as I said last period, I have a random walk uh, shown. So uh, that's the pink line. And the random walk is, um, is generated by the random number generator. I, I fixed the random number generator, so I made it truly normal this time. Uh, and it slows it down a little bit. But uh, if you press F9, we get another uh, random walk. But it's always the same stock price. Uh, this is a random walk with a trend that matches the uptrend of the stock price. So uh, I can press uh, it. So it, it kind of looks similar, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of shows that, in some basic sense, the stock market and the random walk are, are, are the same. Uh, here we have the crash of, here we have the market peak of 1929, right? Except it turned out in this simulation to have occurred in 1910. <laughs> Uh, or thereabouts, and then we have the uh, that's the depression of the 30s, except it's not the 30s, <laughs> and I can just push a button and we get something else. I find this amusing. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, unfortunately, we lived through only one of these in our lifetime. Um, there's a TV show about parallel universes, right? Wh what's the name of that show? Can't remember it. Isn't there? Don't you know this show? Where they go in some kind of time machine and they emerge in another parallel universe where history took another course. Well, anyway, uh, these are parallel universes that we're seeing. Um, in some of these universes, Jeremy Siegel would write his book, <laughs> Stocks for the Long Run, and in some of them, he would not. <laughs> because, uh, well, this one he might not. Because in this case, the stock market was just declining for uh, the better part of a century. Uh, and uh, the, the thing I don't see in these charts, and I think we haven't captured it perfectly with just a standard random walk, um, is I don't see a, any crash as big as the 29 crash. I mean, it's hard to get them. I keep pushing F9. Um, this just seems to dominate, right? There's nothing as big here. Uh, press F9 again. I mean, you can keep pushing and pushing, <laughs> and maybe you'll get one. <laughs> but you, have, you get the idea that there's something anomalous about that crash from the standpoint of this random walk theory. I'm not getting one, right? Uh, and that's something we'll talk about. I, I, I would attribute, I'm not, I can push for a long time and I don't see, well, there's a pretty big one. Isn't that just about as sharp? Not quite as sharp as 19, uh, the 1929 crash, but it's hard to get them. Uh, so I, I think that one thing, there's a couple of things that we'll come back to. One is, I think I've already mentioned it, fat tails, that uh, stock price movements have a tendency to uh, show some extreme outliers that are not represented by the normal distribution. But also, uh, there's variations in the variance. So in this period here, in the 20s and 30s, the stock market was extremely variable on a day-to-day -day basis. It was way beyond anything we've observed since. Uh, and so uh, that's why it seems to be more volatile in that period, because accumulation of bigger uh, random shocks. So uh, anyway, we can play this game for a while. But, uh, now I wanted to then go and talk about, remember that the, the, the random walk that we see in stock prices is not the behavior of a drunk, even though you can describe a random walk as drunken behavior. But the idea in the theory is that this, these movements only appear random because they're news, and news is always unpredictable. That the market is doing the best job, this is efficient markets, in predicting the future. And so uh, that, uh, that means then that any time the stock market moves, it's because something surprising happened. Like there might be a new breakthrough in science, or uh, there could be a war, or Something outside, th this is the story, outside of the economic system that disrupts things. So um, 
The next question then, that, and now I've added something to the, it, it's on this little um, tab here. I've added something which is uh, a plot of present values. And this is something that I published in 1981. Well, it's a long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> it, it was my first big uh, success. Well, I, not everyone liked this article, but what I, <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble for it. Uh, I learned uh, some people uh, react to hostility when you uh, offend their cherished beliefs. So I was on the outs for a while <laughs> with this article. But I said, well, it's kind of interesting to think that all these apparently random movements are really resulting in news about something that is fundamental, right? That's the efficient markets. Every time the stock market moves, it's because there was some news about, about what? <laughs> well, it's about present value. The efficient markets theory, in its simplest incarnation, says that the price is the expected present value of future dividends. So what I did in a paper that I published in 1981 is I said, well, let's just plot the present value of dividends through time. Uh, and that's how I constructed this long time series back to 1871. Nobody else was looking at it. Uh, you know, typically, researchers want the best data, the high quality data. And so they would look at recent data, which is the best data. And they would think going back to 1871 is, is crazy because that's so long ago. When we have daily or minute by minute data by now, we can't get it for that remote period. But on the other hand, as I argued, the stock market is pricing things that occur over long periods of time. The present value formula is pricing dividends into the future, decades into the future. Well, actually to the infinite future, but most of the weight is on the next few decades. So we can't evaluate the theory by just looking at 10 years of data. We've got to get a lot of data. So what I did then in, in that paper is I computed the actual present value of subsequent dividends for each year. And that's on this tab and compared it with the stock price. Okay, so that's what I did. Th this is an update of, an art of a plot that I showed in uh, my 1981 American Economic Review paper. So the blue line, because when I published it, I was right here. It's amazing how time goes by, right? No, 1979, I was right here. We had just come off from a big stock market drop, but the um, uh, the, well, it was the 70, uh, 73, 75 drop. It was a couple of years later, so we were kind of bumbling around down here. We didn't have any idea whether this was coming <laughs> at that time. But so what I did is I just, for each year, I computed the present value of the dividend. I have a dividend series for every year. In fact, it's, it's right over here. Um, I have to, uh, this is the data. So, um, I have the, 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 this is the S&P price index monthly back to 1871. And here's the dividends they paid per share every year uh, since 1871. So I, I just, for each year, I took all subsequent dividends and I, um, I um, priced them out at uh, 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 the present value formula. And I used a constant discount rate of 6% a year. Uh, and so you see how we get what the present value was. I, of course, there's a problem is we don't know dividends at the, after 2007, because we don't have data <laughs> on dividends past then. But I just made some assumption. So the, the value at the end is maybe a little bit arbitrary. It could be dragged up or down if I made a different assumption about dividends at the end. But more or less, this is going to be what actually the present value of dividends was over this whole period. And so. So here's the dilemma, and this is the, what I said in my 1981 article. This is the thing that is supposed to be forecasted, right? That's the present value. And the blue line is the forecast of that thing. So then you ask, does this look like a good forecast? Were people doing a good job of forecasting the red line with the blue line? Uh, now that may be a loaded question, uh, but uh, I think that you get the impression that there's something possibly wrong here with efficient markets. Because the red line is just a smooth growth path, like nothing happens to it. Uh, and yet the, the stock market is going up and down all over the place. Uh, so it's a little bit like uh, if you had a weather forecaster, all right? 
And uh, this morning he says, I, I predict today that the low today will be minus 100 degrees. <laughs> okay. And then uh, two days later he says, I predict that the low today will be plus 150 degrees. Uh, you would eventually start concluding that this weather forecaster can't be trusted because we never get to those temperatures. And that's sort of what the stock market is doing. It's, it's fluctuating much more than the thing that's forecasted. Of course, you've got to be careful. I, I ended up with so many critics. There's a lot of uh, issues here that uh, some people said, well, but of course people don't know where the red line was last period. Uh, and other people said, well, you just are showing one reality for the realization. You're showing, th they kind of get back to this parallel universe story. There must be another universe where there's another Earth and where everything looks the same except that the red line did something very different, <laughs> okay? And that could be. So people are saying, you never know, there could have been a communist revolution in America uh, in the 1930s and they could have nationalized the whole stock market. And then the red line would be down at zero, right? They would have taken the whole thing. Uh, or there could have been some good news, I don't know, some great breakthrough that we haven't discovered yet, but in, in another reality they could have. And so all this noise in the stock market could have somehow been new information about things that didn't happen. Um, and so, um, well, I mean, I think we're getting kind of philosophical when we go to that. The point is that we've never seen any movement in the present value of dividends that would justify the movement. And if we knew the future with certainty according to this model, then the stock market would behave like the red line, not like the blue line. So, um, uh, well, anyway, I, uh, for example, let's look at the Great Depression of the 1930s. At least, at the very least, I think this chart will show, uh, reveal some misconceptions that some people have. The Great Depression of the 1930s was awful, right? I mean, you hear these stories? I, I assume you hear these stories. We had 25 percent unemployment at the peak, uh, right? Sounds really bad. We had people selling apples on the street. You must know these images, right? So it sounds awful. But look what happened to P star in the Great Depression. I can't hardly see anything. Well, what actually happened was businesses continued paying their dividends right through the whole <laughs> depression, and some of them cut their dividends, uh, but it was only for a few years, you know. And so the present value of, the value of stock depends on what it pays out over decades, not just next year. So the stock market, if people knew the, even if they knew the depression was coming, they shouldn't have marked down the stock market so much, uh, according to the simple efficient market story, according to the present value story. So, I, you know, at the very least, I think that this diagram helps you to see what, uh, what is, um, what is wrong, or what simple theories are wrong. And so it must be that if the stock market is reacting to new information over all this century of history, it must have been new information about things that just didn't happen. You know, m it could be <laughs> that an asteroid almost struck the Earth and then <laughs> it just missed. And so uh, the stock market crashed and then when it missed, it came back up again, right? And so but we don't see any interruption in dividends. But it has to be something like that. Uh, that uh, that the, the problem is I can't think of anything like that. I don't think that any asteroid came close to the Earth, uh, not close enough to be worried about, and I can't think uh, that the communist revolution had much chance of taking place in the United States. So, uh, but you can imagine, and so we don't know. Uh, behavioral finance kind of tends to reach the opposite conclusion that this volatility in the stock market is the sign of something else. It's some social forces, some speculative bubbles, some activity that uh, is not related to anything fundamental. And so the reason I got so much hostility when I wrote these papers is I was, I was striking a nerve, I guess, because many people had developed these beautiful mathematical theories that said that the stock market was the optimal predictor of everything. And I was uh, saying the emperor has no clothes. So <laughs> There are others uh, like that. Um, so what is happening, you know, what, what I'm coming around to think, maybe it's my cynical view, I've always been a cynic. I, I don't know if you are cynics or not, but I think people convince themselves of things. They, they, people think they understand things better than they are. And so you, know, you spend your whole life looking at this one picture of the stock market and you think you have an explanation for all of it, all rational, good 
But you know, it's just overconfidence that's doing that. It's an illusion. Uh, so I wanted to talk about overconfidence. Uh, and uh, I, I thought I would try. Oh, there's also no eraser. <laughs> I forgot to ask. Uh, somebody is stealing things here. Um, uh, can you find an eraser for me? <laughs> Meanwhile, I can switch blackboards. I, I, there's a little trick here. It was probably just in this closet or something. No, it's locked. Uh, so I wanted to try an experiment of asking you uh, a series of a few short questions. Uh, and um, it's a game we, we'll play, which I'll need your cooperation with. Uh, so uh, these are questions about overconfidence. Uh, but actually, I just want you to, I want you to try to give me 90% um, confidence intervals for the, <laughs> the answers to these questions. Um, do you know what a 90% confidence interval? It's, uh, it's um, for example, if I were to ask you, uh, uh, what? Um, how, uh, how, many, how many people are there uh, in New Haven? And uh, I want you to not just give me a number, I want you to give me a range such that you're 90% sure that you're right. All right, so I could say, well, it's between uh, 90,000 and 100,000 people, and I'm 90% sure I'm right. So if you give me a true 90% confidence interval, then uh, you should be right 90% of the time, right? So what I'm going to do is give you a few uh, questions and, and ask, you, uh, for a 90, ask you to write down, you have a piece of paper there, a 90% confidence interval. Okay, and uh, I have five questions. This is just an experiment, all right? Uh, the first one is about the Statue of Liberty. Okay, what does it weigh in pounds? Okay, no, in, in tons, okay? So, um, good, thank you. Uh, so, weight. Uh, incidentally, just to remind you, a ton is a U.S. ton is 2,000 pounds, not a British ton, which is 2,240 pounds. Uh, and a ton is 907 kilograms, okay? So, what, can you write down on your uh, paper your 90% confidence interval, all right? So, for example, I won't use realistic numbers. If you thought it was, you might write down it's between one pound and three pounds, okay? And that you're 90% sure it falls in that interval. Um, and um, I didn't say it. it's tons, tons. I'm mean, asking you, it's more than a pound. I'll give you a hint. <laughs> it's, it's in tons. And I want, now we, we also said we're not weighing the base. The, the Statue of Liberty stands on a tall, um, on a tall edifice. We're not counting that, but we're counting also the steel reinforcing that they put in a few years ago. Remember the Statue of Liberty was getting weak and they were worried that something might topple down, so they, they reinforced it on the end. We're counting that. So it's a copper structure with um, uh, steel reinforcement. So can you write down on your notes a, a, a range within which you're 90% sure uh, that the statue weighs? Okay? In tons. All right, if you could do that. And I'm going to come back. What I'm going to do is come back and see how often you were right. So we'll, we'll go back through these. Have you all written down a weight for the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> uh, okay. Population of the country, Turkey. Uh, but since I don't have the current population, I want it in. The year 2000. <laughs> I didn't get the current latest estimate. So, how many people were there in Turkey in 2000? Okay, and again, put down a range, a low and a high, that 90% sure. Um, third is Sahara Desert. How many square miles? In the Sahara Desert, okay, um, and uh, remember that a square mile is 2.6 square kilometers. Just in case you think in terms of kilometers, so you could devise your answer in kilometers and then multiply by 2.6. Uh, 
Um, again, write down a range. OK. Uh, enrollment at Yale. By the way, I, I should have asked. You have to be honest with it. You could game me by, by writing really wide intervals for uh, nine of the ten questions and then an extremely narrow interval for the tenth. And uh, I, I'm expecting some sincere, sincere cooperation here. Then you would guarantee that you were right exactly 90% of the time, right? So, I mean, you could say the Statue of Liberty weighs between zero and 100 quintillion tons, and you know you're right. Right, and then you could deliberately say the population of Turkey is one between one and two people, and then you know you're wrong, and you could do that. You're not supposed to do that, okay? Uh, so the I want the enrollment in Yale. And I don't have the latest number, 2005. Okay, that's the total number of students at Yale University in 2005, including Yale College and all the graduate schools. Okay, uh, and then the sixth, the fifth question. Is about the Pulitzer Prize. You know this prize? It's a prize that journalists win for writing great uh, articles and, or books. I want to know what is the, how much do you get in cash if you win the Pulitzer Prize? All right, and I have it for last year, 2007. It might be different in 2008. So I'm asking for the 2007 in dollars. Okay. In dollars. Okay. So I hope you were honest in <laughs> putting confidence intervals. Have you gotten them? Now, what I'm going to do, uh, if you've answered all five questions, I'm going to uh, tell you the answers, the correct answer, and then ask for a show of hands of how many. If you, please be honest. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> Raise your hand if. Uh, if you were right, Main, meaning that if my answer falls within your 90% confidence interval. Okay? So, okay, let's go to the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty weighs 252 tons. Okay. So, can I have a show of hands? How many people here had it, has 252 in the interval? Okay. <laughs> okay, you're doing fairly well. <laughs> what, what fraction? Keep your hands up. It looks like it's about. Uh, what, what would you say, like 20%, 25? So I, I thank you for being honest <laughs> and not gaming me. It should have been 90%, right? Who were right? Okay, what is the 2000 population of Turkey? Uh, I'll give you the exact number uh, that I got from their statistic 65,666,000. Six thousand six hundred and seventy-seven. Okay, so that's a little over sixty-five million. So, uh, how many people have that in their interval? Okay, that's better. It's like forty percent, fifty, forty or fifty. You're doing you're doing better, <laughs> but it's still not ninety. How many square miles in the Sahara Desert? Three point five million. Okay, can I get a show of hands? How many were right on that? Oh, this one really got you. <laughs> that was like 5%, right? Is anyone right on all of them so far? No. Um, enrollment in Yale, f fall 2005, 11,483 students. Okay, how many were right? Um, okay, that's about uh, 40, it might be close to 40, 40%, I'd say. And finally, how much do you win if you? Re how much do you receive if you win the Pulitzer Prize? Ten thousand dollars. Can I have a show of hands? <laughs> that was a okay. That was really low. That's like five percent. I knew that was a trick because you've heard about the Nobel Prize. Th those are both prestigious, right? Nobel Prize gives you something on the order of a million dollars, and the Pulitzer Prize gives you something like it only gives you ten thousand dollars. So how can that be? Uh, so I sort of picked something that I thought you might be wrong on. This is a, that reveals something about human behavior. People, you know, it, it's, a th it's a choice in life. You go into different walks of life. This is something that is fundamental to economics. There's just different expectations about how much money you're going to make. And if you go into the news media, and I think that's a wonderful career, but you're not going to make much money, probably. <laughs> and the whole thing is just scaled down. 
Uh, and I think this, uh, uh, there's something revealing about this, that uh, we just have social norms for how much someone is to be paid. So if you were to give Stephen Schwartzman a $10,000 prize, it would be more like an insult <laughs> than anything. Uh, but if you are working for the New Haven Register and you get this prize, it's, it's a life-changing event. Not because of the 10000 maybe. Even they get more money than that. But anyway, the point was that uh, people tend to be overconfident. Uh, and incidentally, it's not just males. Females are well known <laughs> to be overconfident, too. So there is this thing about macho males, know-it-all, <laughs> but experiments prove that uh, women have the same problem. And so, um, so that's why I think that when we look at charts of the stock market, we see things that we think we understand. Especially young people, they get deluded into thinking they understand uh, more than they really do. So uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, some authors that uh, uh, I admire who've written about this. Um, and. Um, These are books that I don't have on the reading list, but they're, they're fun to read. Uh, there's a professor at the Harvard Business School, Rakesh Kurana. Uh, he has a book uh, on the search for charismatic CEOs. That is, companies, uh, it's not just overconfidence in yourself, we tend also to put overconfidence in leaders. And so we, we have the, uh, this is an A at the end. We have a sense that some people are just natural geniuses and know everything. And so we, 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 uh, we think that they can transform our lives or our companies. And so uh, boards of directors are constantly looking for a CEO who is a genius. And they keep getting fooled and dis disappointed. They bring someone in, and this person often messes things up more than helps because. This person realizes that he or she has to live up to this genius role, so they better do something. So they, they do something in a flailing way, not understanding what they're doing, and they mess up the whole company. So really, it, m a lot of what happens in good things that happen in human society are the result of lots of people doing their own special things and all working together, and there's no great genius uh, underneath. But th there's this idea in our mind that one, what we are. Uh, going to be such a thing. Um, um, related to that, I wanted to mention, and it's on the reading list, um, an article by um, one of my students uh, in this class who's now at MIT. Uh, he took this class uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, Fadi Kanan, uh, and co authored with another MIT professor, uh, Dirk Genter. Uh, and again, looking at uh, overconfidence in our judgments, again, they looked at CEOs, chief executive officers of companies, and they found that um, companies uh, the, in industries that fail tend to fire their CEOs. Uh, this, is un this is unjust. This is an overreaction. You, you bring in this CEO who's supposed to be brilliant, okay, and then the business fails. So you fire the guy right after that. You're, you're so, you, you know, we're kind of manic depressive about these guys. When, when the business fails, we think, we were such a mistake. This guy had such promise and he just didn't live up, so we get rid of him. But in fact, they found that the, the CEO gets fired even if the whole industry went down. So, I mean, you can't blame the CEO for, for the fact, you know, if you're one company in an industry and the whole industry goes down, uh, or, the, or the, the remaining industry, even not including that firm. It's not the CEO's fault. So we tend to be kind of wild and extreme in our judgments. You've seen that a lot. A lot of CEOs lost their jobs recently in the subprime crisis. Uh, was it their fault? Probably not, you know, but they get fired anyway. Uh, so we go through this manic depressive, uh, we try to hire charismatic CEOs, <laughs> then we get disappointed and we keep going through musical chairs. Uh, one after another. Um, and then uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, who lives here in Connecticut, and I know him well. He has a book called Fooled by Randomness, which was a bestseller. Uh, and it's very fun to read. 
it's a story. He was at Wall Street. Uh, he had an um, a investment ma management firm, uh, and he observed a lot of people. And it, it's a book about how people uh, overinterpret. They tend to blame themselves for failures and congratulate themselves for successes too much. And they don't realize that it's just random. So, some guy who's in a business, what, the business is succeeding. Why is it succeeding? Because the guy came in dumb luck at the right time and everything is, is supporting that, uh, concludes that he's a genius. Uh, and then uh, Talib observes them later after, after uh, <laughs> things don't go so well. Uh, and then suddenly they're, uh, they are depressed. And, uh, uh, you know, I talked to uh, uh, stockbrokers before and after the 87 stock market crash. And one of them told me, or maybe more than one of them told me, I can tell that the, the crash occurred from the tone of voice of the people when they call up the phone. So when the market was soaring just before the 87 peak, he said, they would call up and they were brash and rude to me and they would say, let's trade, let's get this done, they kind of uh, dis disparaging subtly the, uh, the stockbroker. And then after the crash, when these people were sort of, many of them wiped out, They'd answer the phone in a sheepish way. You could just tell in the tone of their voice that they were crushed, um, and so that's what happens. I also have down on the um, on, on this part of the reading list Irving Fisher, uh, who was a professor at Yale, uh, who uh, was a, v a very prominent economist in the first half of the century. He's another Yale graduate. <laughs> Uh, Yale class of 1895, I think. He, I'm sure he lectured on this stage because this building was, was his office was in this building, I believe. Uh, he died around the mid 1940s, but he's famous for overconfidence. Uh, in 1929, he was interviewed just before, two weeks before the 1929 peak. And do you know what I'm referring to? Uh, he said he thought the stock market was on a permanently high plateau. Uh, and he wrote a book uh, in 1929. Actually, it came out in 1930 about the uh, with this extremely optimistic outlook for the market. Uh, and uh, he had a beautiful mansion. He was a wealthy man for a while, but he lost everything in the stock market crash. In fact, he had to, he he had borrowed against his home and he lost his house. Uh, and so Yale University bought his house for him and rented it out to him. Otherwise, he would be on the street. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so I have him. I have an article written by him in 1930. I think it's 1930, or at the end of 29, discussing the stock market crash, and he still is unrepentant. Now, this was our most brilliant professor here at Yale, but he just totally misjudged the market. Uh, so he's just totally unrepentant. He just went back over his book. There's so many good reasons. The 20s were a spectacular era. There's so many good reasons. The stock market will keep going up, and he just wouldn't back down. In fact, what he actually did is he started borrowing from his relatives. He had wealthy relatives, and he lost all of it. <laughs> so, uh, um, he just couldn't have imagined that the stock market would go down. There was just no reason that he could think of it. Uh, and that's what he says in the article. So anyway, um, I wanted to talk more precisely about um, how people behave. This is all general about overconfidence. But there are some other uh, factors that uh, I want to uh, start with, and that the most, imp the most important theory in behavioral uh, finance is the um, Kahneman and Tversky prospect theory. So Danny Kahneman, uh, who is now a professor of psychology at Princeton, and Amos Tversky, uh, who uh, is, uh, died a few years ago, they wrote, the, I think, the most famous article on, uh, uh, on behavioral economics. Uh, it goes beyond just finance. Uh, and the title of the article was Prospect Theory. Okay, and that was 1979. Uh, this is, I think, the most. Actually, I think there was a, a, a ranking of economics articles, scholarly articles, by numbers of quotations, and this was number two out of all articles written in the last 50 years. Uh, number one, I, I, 
was, it was quoted for some other reason. I, I'm not sure. It was some statistical method that everyone quoted. But in terms of an intellectual contribution, this is the most important economics article in the last 50 years, at least judged by how many times it's cited. Uh, and so Kahneman and Tversky are not really talking about overconfidence, but something, well, perhaps related to it, something more general. It's how people make choices. And uh, there's two elements to this theory. It's a re it replaces expected utility. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it has uh, what it does, it replaces the utility function with a value function. With value function, and it replaces the uh, probabilities with what he what they call weights. So I'm going to explain what that is, and uh, we'll move on. But um, let me give a little story that leads up to it, uh, and it's a story uh, that uh, Paul Samuelson, is a professor at MIT, told. Paul Samuelson uh, was a highly esteemed. He is, I think he's 92 or 90, about 92 years old now, and still writing, <laughs> still working. Uh, he was a math. He is a mathematical economist, retired now. But uh, he told a story uh, that illustrates some of the beginnings of prospect. In fact, he kind of anticipated prospect theory. This goes back to an article that he wrote uh, in 1963. So, uh, in 1963, he was having lunch with one of his colleagues, another economist. He doesn't name this other person because it would be embarrassing, but everyone knows it was E. Carey Brown, a professor at MIT. And so, Samuelson, uh, in a playful mood, he was always was sort of a playful uh, person, he said um, at lunch, he said, Hey, let's f toss a coin. Let's make a bet just for the fun of it, okay? And if it comes up heads, I'll give you $200. But if it comes up tails, you give me a hundred dollars, and he said, "Let's do it. I'm ready." Okay, <laughs> and this kind of took E. Carey Brown by surprise. That's, that that sounds like a lot of money, especially in 1963. Right, the prices were much lower. That's like uh, uh, what was it, like a thousand dollars and two thousand something. It was big money. But of course, these professors could afford it. Uh, uh, it's not that much money, so let's just say it's a hundred and two hundred, right? Do you feel like, if I were to offer that to you right now, let's do it. Because you don't have the cash on you now, but you'd have to promise to pay me if it came out wrong. All right? Do you feel like doing that? If I were? <laughs> no. Someone is telling, answering me honestly. Uh, introspect and think about it, where this is suddenly thrust on you. Um, yeah, well, so E. Carey Brown said, Oh, come on, I don't, you know, don't want to do this. Samuelson was being annoying by doing this. Uh, then Samuelson thought it had another idea. He said, What if I offered, he didn't actually offer this, what if I offered to, let's do this a hundred times? We'll toss a coin a hundred times, and each time it comes up heads, I give you $200, and each time it comes up tails, you give me $100. Well, E. Carey Brown, knowing mathematics of statistics and the law of probabilities, he said, Well, if we do it a hundred times, by the you know binomial theorem, I'm sure to win. I couldn't possibly. This is elementary. A hundred times is a lot of times. In fact, I'll make thousands of dollars. And so E. Carey Brown said, "I'll do it. I would do it." They didn't actually do it. And Samuelson then said uh, he, he went back to his office and he wrote a paper. That's this uh, 1963 paper proving that E. Carey Brown was irrational. <laughs> You cannot possibly say, I will take a hundred of them, but I won't take one of them. That's not rational. Uh, and so that was one of the motivating things in Kahneman and Tversky. So what Kahneman and Tversky said is that people behave, and, and if you can introspect and imagine why some of you didn't feel like taking this bet, uh, people behave as if they, they have a kink in their utility. And th this may sound an abstract way of putting it, but uh, expected utility theory. Uh, the traditional theory says that everybody uh, has a utility function that they consistently refer to when making calculations. So I'm going to put Kahneman Tversky over here, and I'm going to put 
um, expected utility theory over here. And so expected utility theory says that I want wealth. I call W wealth. And I get utility from wealth. That's U. And my utility curve, it has maybe any of a number of shapes, but it's concave downward and smooth. So you have what's called diminishing marginal utility. Right? That's expected utility theory. So what expected utility theory means, th the slope is always decreasing. Every extra dollar of wealth gives me less happiness. Uh, but it's, it always gives me a little bit more. So I always want more. But expected utility theory would say that that's a two for one bet that Samuelson is offering. Uh, and it's small compared to my lifetime wealth. So my utility is essentially linear over the relevant range, plus, or mi plus 200 or minus 100. And so, um, and so I, don't, uh, I don't really concern myself about risk. I should just take every bet like that all the time. Uh, and so you should always be looking. If you, if you were behaving this way, you should always be looking. Anyone who wants to make a bet with me, any time, I'll always take it if it's in my advantage, even a little bit in my advantage. Um, now, people seem to like to gamble, but they don't like to do it consistently. It, they like to go to, a, they, they end up going to gambling casinos where they, it's stacked against them, not for them, but it somehow is arranged as an as a, um, entertainment. Well, Kahneman and Tversky said that uh, people don't behave this way. And it's as if they have a value function as a function of their money. And, uh, and let's put in the middle of the value from the reference point. I, I can't write down that word. Reference point means where you are today. And your value, that's V, which is like utility, but now we're talking in psychological terms. And so we give it a different name. The value function has a, uh, a kink. It's something like that at the reference point. So, and then I'm trying to draw it. Uh, it's not necessarily, I have it mixed, like, it looks here like two straight lines. And that, that's not quite the way they do it. Let me try and do this again. Um, it's, it's curved downward a little bit, but it, it becomes much less. I don't want to, I'm having trouble drawing this on the board well. I don't want it ever going down. It, it, um, there's a kink here. Or the slope, I think I've got it sort of there. It's concave down everywhere, just like the utility function is, but there's a discontinuity of slope right here. And where is that? That's where I am now. And so what it means is, is that I value losses much more than I value gains from wherever I am. There's a big difference between losing and winning. So when I, when I reflect on this bet, I'm thinking of, I could lose $100. And that scares me. It feels bad, the idea that I would, I would, I would just feel bad. Um, and so gaining $200 is positive for me, but it doesn't offset the loss that I might make. So if I have equal probabilities, uh, what, what you want to do is weight the, the gains and losses. And it, the, the losses tend to dominate, so you don't want to take the bet. So the weighting function in, incorporates the Samuelson's lunch colleague problem. Uh, that people don't want to take bets that are to their advantage. And it goes back to a kink in the utility fund. Now, incidentally, this is fundamentally different from, uh, in economic theory, economists would say, well, you can put a kink in the utility function. There could be some wealth level that's special to you. But if you're economists, that kink has to stay at a certain wealth level. With Kahneman and Tversky, this kink moves around with you. And so whatever, it's whatever you're always at the kink. So, uh, because it's, it's not rational. This is not rational expected utility theory. This is, I'm always looking at where I am now and exaggerating in my mind the importance of deviations from that. So, people are very concerned with small losses. Uh, and that, that's what the kink in the value function. Now, I want to talk then about another uh, Kahneman and Tversky uh, thing they're called the weighting function. Uh, so, the weighting function, uh, it refers to the fact that people 
distort probabilities in their mind. And what it, uh, it it's, it's not that they don't know probabilities, but they distort them in their thinking. And so I'll give uh, an example that illustrates the Kahneman Tversky weighting function. And it goes back years before Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, it's a famous example from a French economist, Maurice Allais. And it's called the Allais Paradox. Uh, and it illustrates uh, thinking that violates expected utility theory. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to give you a choice between two prospects, as Kahneman and Tversky call them. Suppose I offered you uh, a 25% chance uh, to, to win um, $3,000. Or uh, uh, alternatively, a twenty percent chance to win four thousand dollars. Okay, maybe I can get your a show of hands. Okay, this is like Samuelson lunch colleague again, but a little different. Suppose I'm offering, I'm not, I'm not offering this, but suppose I offered this. You have a choice between prospect one or prospect two. Prospect one, I'm going to toss a four sided coin, and if it comes up uh, with a probability of one fourth in a certain way, you will win $3,000. And in prospect two, uh, I'm going to give you a chance of 20% to win $4,000. Can you tell me which of these you'd pick if you had to pick only one of these? Do you understand the question? OK, how many would pick uh, number one? OK, it, se it seems like it's about 20%. How many would pick number two? So most of you would pick number two. Uh, but then let's do a variation on this question here. It's a very simple variation. Um, which would you prefer? So this is the one that you picked, most people pick. Okay. Another prospect, 100% chance of winning 3,000. Or two, uh, that would be an 80% chance of winning $4,000. OK, do you see the? OK, if you pick prospect one, you, you're going to just get $3,000 for sure. If you pick prospect two, you, you'd probably get $4,000, but an 80% chance of it. How many would pick one? OK, that looks like the most. How many would pick two? Oh, very few of you would pick two. <laughs> and now you have to reflect. So, so we picked one this time. So now you might want to reflect on that. Why was it such a different? Uh, well, why, why did you pick one in this case? And pick two in this case. You, the thing I want to point out is that the number, the, the cash amounts are the same in the two examples, but the probabilities are just multiplied by four, right? So the expected utility of the two is just four times as great, uh, no matter what probability, you know, yeah. Maybe well, yeah. So th they're the same, the, the utilities are the same with the same numbers. All I've done is multiply your expected utility by four in this case. So you can't make a different choice. If you pick two in over here when comparing these two prospects, you should also have picked two when you compared these two prospects. So why didn't you? Why, was, uh, most of you switched. Uh, can you tell me why? Any, uh, uh, yes. You would choose not to gamble. Does this mean it's like a moral judgment? Or? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, you got it exactly. That's yeah. You got you prefer certainty. There, there's some anxiety about maybe about uh, about uh, 
the, the, you, you got exactly right. I think people like certainty, uh, and, and ambiguity uh, is, uh, is difficult for them to adjust to. So, uh, but Kahneman and Tversky put it in this following way. That it's it's a little bit like we're cavemen. You know, uh, it, it turns out you know, we we're all taught to count and to do arithmetic, but primitive people actually have difficulty counting. And there's an old story that cavemen had only three numbers: one, two, and many. Uh, I used to disbelieve this story, but I met actually it was a psychologist at Princeton told me that as, as a matter of fact, it's proven that there are some people whose languages have only those th numbers: one, two, and many. Uh, and uh, for example, they, they're called in um, Laos and Thailand. There's a very primitive group of people with primitive technology. I don't mean if they're primitive people, but uh, they only have one, two, and many. And there's others that have been discovered. Uh, so I I emotionally, we're like that. I used to wonder how could how could they have only those numbers, one, two, and many? Like, could you ask a mother how many children do you have, <laughs> and she couldn't answer. <laughs> she didn't have the word three. But as a matter of fact, they didn't. And so I guess if you asked a mother how many children you have, she would probably just name them, right? She couldn't say, I have three children. Um, but anyway, we're, we're all kind of like that when we think about probabilities. That's Kahneman and Tversky. So what Kahneman and Tversky say that we do is that in our minds, we weight the probabilities in a distorted way. And this is the weighting function. So we have the weight. That's weight, not wealth here, against the probability. And I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, this is 0, and this is 1, because probabilities range from 0 to 1. The weighting function looks like this. I'm exaggerating a little bit so you can see. but And then it jumps up, or it jumps down here. This is the idea. What Kahneman and Tversky said in their original 79 article is that we act as, see, see there's, there's a wide range of probabilities here that are all kind of blurred and put together. So uh, we, we, we minimize emotionally the difference between probabilities. They're all kind of in the middle. So when I said 20 or 25, in your mind, you said, well, here's 20 and here's 25, but I don't think they're much different to me emotionally. The money sounds different, but the probabilities sound the same. So I, it's like I have. Only three probabilities can't happen, might happen, and is certain to happen. Okay? And so you tend to be pulled into these certainty stories. That you give them much more weight. So the way what people do then, in, uh, summing up, in expected utility theory, in expected utility theory, you maximize the probability weighted sum of utilities. Expected utility. You maximize the summation of the probability of the ith outcome times the utility in the ith outcome. But in prospect theory, you maximize the the sum of the weights. Times the value function, the values, okay, and that's that's this is the Kahneman and Tversky uh, variation on expected utility theory. So uh, there's something related to it that uh, psychologists talk about. It's called regret theory, but it's it's a little bit different, but it's essentially the same as uh, it's consistent with pro uh, prospect theory. Uh, and that is that people uh, experience pain of regret. And they do a lot of things to try to avoid uh, the pain of regret. For example, when a stock price, stock market goes up, uh, they, uh, they try to sell it and lock in the game because they, 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 they would worry that if it goes down again, I, I will regret not having sold it. And so that's not a rational calculation. Uh, if you come to, some, you, you come to something, you, you just have it and then it escapes you, you feel pain. I guess that's what happened at the Super Bowl last night, right? When uh, <laughs> the New England Patriots had a winning streak and they messed up at the very end. That's exceptionally painful, uh, and that's part of regret theory. I don't know how pained any of you are, but uh, it must have been painful to them anyway. Uh, 
So, uh, um, so I just mentioned some other uh, uh, things that are related to prospect theory. Uh, there's something called mental compartments that uh, people uh, expected utility theory says your utility depends on your whole lifetime wealth. And so you should be always walked, always thinking that everything that happens today is just part of a bigger story. And I'm always thinking about my lifetime. And, and the, you know, I, I, I had you do an exercise at the beginning where I asked you to estimate the present value of your lifetime income. And it probably came out to several million dollars. And so if, if you were behaving rationally, you would always be weighing things against that big sum of several million dollars. That's why plus $100 plus minus 200 who cares, right? That's the way you should be thinking. <laughs> but you don't think that way because, it's because you are human. And so people put things in mental compartments, all different compartments in your mind, and you have separate values for things depending on which compartment they're in. So for example, uh, when you go to the gambling casino, the winnings and losses are completely different. You just put them in a game compartment and you think, I can accept these and it doesn't matter. Investors are that way too. They will sometimes put part of their portfolio in, I can play with this uh, mental compartment and others in a, another mental compartment. Um, so uh, anyway, I just wanted to come back and uh, I, I have uh, maybe a little bit more to uh, say about this. but. Let me come back and talk just about the, the problem set we talked about last period. Um, problem set number three. You've got your second problem set here. Problem set number three is a stock market forecasting exercise. And the spreadsheet that I have up here is one spreadsheet that you could use to, uh, to do this. And it's illustrated. I, I, I clarified it a little bit in the version I put up. So you run a regression like that uh, to predict the stock market. Uh, and well, this is actually a hands-on experience that's supposed to help you eliminate your overconfidence <laughs> by trying to predict the market. Uh, but um, this is uh, the example where I tried to use time uh, as a predictor of the, uh, of the stock market and failed uh, pretty decisively to do so. Uh, but what I want to say is that uh, I, I have this spreadsheet up here which has some data. It has monthly data. This is my um, 130 year long uh, stock price series. But um, you could add other data. Uh, and whatever, if you can find data series somewhere, it might be, it would be more fun uh, to try to predict uh, using other data. And so th this is just uh, for you to really try to do it. Some people do, did sports things. So if somebody wins the Super Bowl, <laughs> the, I don't know what the story is. This is a famous story, actually. Uh, the stock market goes up or goes. Do you know that? I, I don't know this exact uh, repeated story. So you could create other variables, like a dummy variable for winning the somebody winning the Super Bowl, and put that in. There's a famous story. Uh, it goes back to the 1930s about skirt lengths and the stock market. Do you know this story? Uh, in the 1920s, uh, an unprecedented thing happened in women's fashion, never been seen before in uh, the United States. Maybe. In, I don't, Women started wearing short skirts, and it was scandalous. They weren't quite mini skirts, but they were scandalous. <laughs> and the women's hemlines rose and peaked in 1929. And then the skirt lengths came down in the 30s, right with the market. And so that was noticed. And some people thought, you know, there was some euphoria that was driving women crazy <laughs> or something. Something about the 20s, the optimism, the sense. Uh, you know, it, it sort of happened again in the 70s. You remember the, the miniskirts came in in the 70s, right? And then the 70s, uh, 74 crash didn't exactly, I don't know if hemlines came down. But so anyway, I had one student who thought, well, maybe uh, there's other fashion things that explain the market. And she went back to microfilm newspapers and uh, measured the width of men's ties in fashion advertisements. And she thought wide ties are a sign of, op it's like a short skirt, I guess. It's a, a sign of optimism and excitement. And so she collected data on widths of ties. She had a time series. This was a very good answer, uh, a very good problem set. And she collected uh, 50 years of data on the widths of men's ties. And 
correlated, see if it predicted the market. And unfortunately, it did not. But <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful try. So I'm hoping that some of you can think of interesting things to do uh, to try to predict the stock market. Uh, all right, so I'll see you uh, again in two days. <laughs>